by Andrea Howe, founder of the Get Real Project. We also have Charles Green, who's uh, CEO and founder of Trust Advisor Associates. Um, they're, they're partnering up to do this four-part webinar series um, there throughout the year. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Andrea. We're going to also start off by launching a poll that everybody can answer uh, about your relationship with uh, trust in, in certain situations. So take it away, Andrea. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jason. And thank you for all your support in getting this set up. Actually, before we go to the poll, although feel free to read it into your responses, we do want to do a couple of housekeeping items. So just so you know, because of the large number of responses to the webinar, we are going to we have muted you by default and we're encouraging questions, ideas, comments, resources, whatever it is you want to share via chat, although there will be a section at the end where we may be able to actually take uh, to unmute lines and so I can actually have a dialogue <laughs> with somebody, which is my preference as always. Um, and this is being recorded, so this is a little reminder, Tracy, if you haven't yet hit the record button, now is a great time. And if you are officially registered for the webinar, you'll get a link and please feel free to share that link with anybody you would like, whether registered for the webinar or not. The poll, as you see that Jason, oh no, let's do a little, we're gonna, so we're managing multiple technology things here. We also wanna practice using the text chat feature. So if you would go ahead and choose, open up the chat box, which you can see in the, your little Zoom panel, you can click chat, go ahead and send to everyone your next planned or desired vacation spot. What is your next? planned or desired vacation spot. Ooh, I see some interesting places. Tahiti, Paris, Japan, Hawaii, simply up north. <laughs> I guess that's all relative, right? Disney cruise, a bar anywhere. I like that. Oh, okay. It's five o'clock somewhere, right? Anywhere warm and sunny, I can relate to that. Ooh, Peru, Mount Washington, Redwood Forest, interesting. Italy, on my bucket list. I've actually never been to any part in Italy, beach and warm water. All right, so um, well done. We'll be using the chat throughout, so keep your fingers warmed up. And if you haven't already uh, entered your response to the poll that Jason put up, please do. The question is, how many of these challenges can you relate to? And I think, Jason, if I remember right, correctly, if I do share results, it will continue to accrue, right? People can continue. I believe so. You can give it a, sh you can give it, I can, I'll give it a try. Okay. Um, All right. So the four I, challenges. I think it removed the ability because I didn't, I didn't answer the survey yet. I can't. So I think we have to keep it live. Got it. I'm going to pause okay. it for now. So yeah, no problem. We'll large. come back to it so you can see what the results are. But the questions are, in terms of challenges, oh, I think we might have just restarted the poll. <laughs> uh, did it restart it? Okay. We have, we've got the, don't worry, you're in great hands. We have everything <laughs> under control. <laughs> the question is how many of the four challenges can you relate to? And you have a chance to pick multiples because trust can be lost in an instant. You might be extra fearful when things go wrong. Maybe you do okay when it comes to salvaging um, situations that go right but you'd like to do better. You sometimes struggle to say the right things when trust is lost. Um, and one of my personal favorites, does it drive you crazy when people don't let the baggage go? In other words, things screw up, things go wrong. You try to repair it and they just can't seem to let it go. So we'll leave that poll open. Uh, for a little bit and come back to that in just a few moments. You've come to the right virtual place, by the way, if you struggle with any of those things, because uh, my goal is to do a number of things. One is bust a myth or two about trust building in general, but in particular as it relates to what are the best ways to recover trust when it's lost. Build your confidence in terms of handling those situations when it happens. Uh, I actually added a bonus. We don't just have five keys to recovering lost trust, but now we have six. And my aim is to have created something that you could easily share with others, whether you choose to share the webinar recording or simply to share uh, what you learned from this experience. I'm going to give you a pretty easy and concrete framework to remember so that you can teach the key lessons to other people. But let's, um, 
Let's do a couple of things. I see so many familiar names on the roster. So hello, hello to those I've worked with in the past. And I also see new friends as well. So just a little bit about me. I am, I have um, Alexa has decided to chime into the webinar with some sort of details about marital something. So I've unplugged her, so <laughs> you won't be worrying about her anymore. Um, if you don't, uh, for those of you who don't know my background, I started my career in IT consulting and have been recovering from that ever since. Long story short, I ended up, because I really was so passionate about the relationship side of consulting, I ended up focusing on that. I got a master's in organization development. I became an author. I take credit for half of the Trusted Advisor field book, which my name is proudly on the cover of, I'm a speaker, corporate educator. Um, by the way, the other two books in the trilogy, which many of you may know, The Trusted Advisor and Trust-Based Selling, the common denominator across all three is my partner and uh, dear friend, Charlie Green, who's also on the webinar today too. And um, I ended up, again, long story short, creating a partnership with him a dozen years ago now. In April, we will celebrate our 12th anniversary of working together and became a principal with Trusted Advisor Associates several years ago, I created something called the Get Real Project. We work in very close collaboration with Trusted Advisor Associates. The Get Real Project is basically a platform for my personal mission, which is to kick conventional business wisdom to the curb and transform how people work together as a result. I work primarily with people in consultative roles. That includes external consultants as well as internal consultants and also business developers. And just by way of the nature of the work that we do, if you're not familiar with it, workshops, self-paced, video-based learning programs, coaching, diagnostics, we've got a new mobile app, um, and more. So that's a little bit about me and us. Now back to you. What I'd really love for you to do is to bring to mind a current or a past situation where you didn't rebuild trust as you could or uh, should have. Um, so maybe it's something from last week, last month, last year, or maybe it's something that you're dealing with today. If you are able to bring a key person to mind, there may be multiple stakeholders involved in the situation, but if a key person does in fact come to mind, if you would please simply type their first name in the text chat box, just by way of having that person be present for you. Excellent. So I see a few people are already beginning to type in. So my request is that you keep this person in mind as we move throughout the webinar and see what you could have applied or what you could apply from what we cover. Now, let's tackle a critical myth to begin with. It is- Hey, Andrew, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm gonna pause you for one second. Uh, yeah, we're gonna um, close the, for the people that just joined, uh, we, we do have a poll open, so we're gonna close that in about a minute. So if you, if you just joined and you didn't fill out the poll, uh, while Andrew is talking, if you could take a quick look at it. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. It is true uh, that stuff happens. Projects go wrong, mistakes happen, issues occur, uh, and sometimes it might even be your fault. And the reality is we just have to deal with that and learn to deal with that as effectively as possible. What's not true, however, that most of us hold as true is that trust is fragile. It's actually far more myth than fact. We, we've all heard and maybe even uttered the saying, trust takes you know, a long time to build, and just an instant to destroy. And actually that isn't necessarily the case at all. By the way, for those of you who, who answered in the poll, because trust can be lost, you're extra fearful. Well, fear not, um, because trust isn't necessarily lost quickly. People lose trust roughly at the level and pace with which it was built in the first place. So if something happens and trust disappears from a relationship, the chances are it actually wasn't very deep to begin with. There was work to be done that hadn't been done. And what's important for us to recognize is that the fear that we all carry about the fragility, the supposed, the mythical fragility of trust stops us. It stops us in general from taking the risks that we need to take to build or rebuild trust. And it stops us in particular from seeing the gaps that exist in terms of um, what we do when something goes wrong. So related to that, another thing that I will assert is true is that when it comes to trust recovery, most of us actually really screw it up. 
All right, so maybe that's a little extreme. I'm being a little hyperbolic. Maybe we don't screw it up, but wow, do we leave opportunities on the table in a really big way. We fall into common traps, get sucked right into the hole, simply because we're human beings. And one of those big traps is that we tend to go about trust recovery far too logically and rationally. So this brings us to one of my favorite frameworks that we're gonna use for our discussion today. Many of you may recognize it, the trust equation. Um, the trust equation was first published in the book, The Trusted Advisor, as an attempt to inform our understanding of how trustworthiness really works. And what it asserts is that there are more rational or logical dimensions of trustworthiness, that's credibility and reliability in the numerator, and there are the more um, non-rational or emotional or psychological dimensions of your trustworthiness, that's intimacy in the numerator and self-orientation in the denominator. So trustworthiness is a function of all four. You increase your scores in the numerator, trustworthiness goes up. You increase your score in the denominator and trustworthiness goes down. So the thing about rebuilding lost trust is that well, whether you're rebuilding or building it in the first place, it's both logical and emotional. So we really have to work all four variables of the trust equation, which leads us to the first of six keys to rebuilding trust is working all four variables. Now, um, by the way, for those of you who answered the poll that you would like to do better when it comes to salvaging situations, this list, my aim is that this list is your friend and it becomes a checklist for you, these six items. So we'll build it together throughout the webinar. Okay, so let's focus on the easier parts and what we normally and naturally do when it comes to recovery, and that is focusing on the rational side. Credibility fundamentally equates to the words we say and how we say them. We build credibility by being knowledgeable, doing our homework, being prepared, knowing about our subject matter, about our industry, having experience. We also, by the way, build credibility by being honest. Now, when it comes to trust recovery, what most of us know to do and don't hesitate to do is find a way to fix it. We bring credibility into the relationship, and oh, by the way, if we're smart, we also not only find out but communicate what went wrong in the first place. This, by the way, is a pet peeve of mine. I, look, I so appreciate when something has happened and my trust has been lost, a mistake has occurred or a goof has been made. I so appreciate when somebody steps in to figure out how to make it better, but it leaves me wanting when it's not explained to me what happened in the first place. Because, and, and whether or not what happened in the first place was there was a technology error or there was a you know, a miscommunication on the team, or, or maybe, you know, somebody simply plain forgot or screwed up. There's something to be said about communicating that. So, um, there's value in getting at the source, there's value in fixing it, there's value, by the way, in being honest. If you don't know or don't know yet what was behind the problem, all of those things help boost credibility. And most of us don't have too much difficulty with that. We know to do it, and we get to work on it. And if anybody has questions throughout the webinar, for those who joined late, there's a chat box that you can, you can access. So feel free to just ask questions throughout the webinar. We'll, we'll stop and answer them. Thanks, Jason. I have this post-it note that says, remember to pause so that Jason can interject with questions. <laughs> so I'll try to remember to read the post-it. Um, the second in the more logical, rational realm in the numerator of the trust equation is reliability basically about actions, the things that we do. And reliability gets built or increased when the, then what we say we're gonna do and what we actually do align. Or by the way, when there's a disconnect between those two things, when we get in communication about that as quickly as possible. In other words, when we convey to other people that we treat our word as our bond. So with trust recovery, there are commitments to make. There are things, there are actions you're going to want to take to remediate a situation or to deal with the consequences, and that's great. And then there's follow through to be done in order to 
uh, increased reliability in that case. And oh, by the way, most of us assume um, because we carry around the myth that tr another myth that trust takes time to build, uh, which it does not, we assume that um, we can't accelerate our scores on any of these variables. The only one of the four that actually absolutely positively takes time to build is reliability. And there are even ways to accelerate that. For example, whether you're building trust or recovering lost trust, you can make lots of small promises and consistently follow through. So that's a way to increase your life. Hey, Andrew, we have two questions already. So the first question is, um, doesn't communicating the reason for the screw up often sound like an excuse? Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. And you know what I think, is that Linda who asked that? Yes. Um, I think that, that that concern, and it's a valid concern, is the reason that many of us don't communicate it. And what I would say is rather than not communicate it because you worry that it's going to sound like an excuse, I would caveat it. And I would simply say, look, at the risk of sounding like I'm making an excuse, I just want to explain so that you know. I also think another point related to that is that timing matters. So if you do that too soon, it can in fact sound like an excuse, like you're trying to you know, what's that acronym, CYA, or trying to somehow get out of any responsibility that you should take in the matter. So I think timing are key is key and caveating is key. And you said there was another one, Jason. Yeah, there's one more question. Actually, there's two, but why don't we answer the first one, then we can move on and get to the next one. Um, why, why do we fail in recovering trust so much? It feels like we don't, if you, uh, it feels like we don't mean to. So I guess, why is it such a challenge? Yeah, well, it's a great question. And in fact, it's, a, it's you're like maybe one slide too soon for the question. <laughs> so um, I wanna bookmark that until we get to the next slide. And maybe Jason, you can remind me, keep me honest to make sure I get to it. The, the simple answer to it is simply because we're human beings and um, we struggle. And because there are emotional or psychological dimensions of trust building and trust rebuilding, uh, even with the best of intentions, our own humanity simply gets in the way. And that's why with the business of trusted advisorship and trust building, I always say in our workshops, first and foremost, it is an inside job. It starts here with knowing yourself and managing yourself. There are very, very close ties to emotional intelligence and what it takes to be effective and grounded and really connected to other people by really knowing yourself and managing yourself well. Is there another one? There's, there was one more question. Uh, how can we figure out what happened if, if, we don't ha if we don't have trust, if we don't know why trust was lost? Mm. In other words, you have a sense, what, what I hear in that question is, and, and correct it if I'm misunderstanding it through text chat, you have a sense that something has gone wrong, but you don't know what. And because trust is missing, it makes it difficult to have the dialogue about that. Um, look, it's, it's hard to know, and human nature is, we make assumptions, we make judgments, we make up stories, we connect dots in our own mind. We somehow, in a vacuum, try to make it all make sense. Um, if that's the case, if you're sensing that trust is lost, in other words, it's not some obvious thing, like you failed to, um, need a deliverable, but there's a something going on in the background, the most trustworthy and by the way, trust rebuilding thing to do is to find a way to actually raise that and address it. And if it's awkward or uncomfortable to do that, that's how you started out with this is awkward, this is uncomfortable, I'm not even sure how to approach this conversation it feels almost like a circular conversation. It seems like trust has been lost. I don't know what's happened. And I don't even know that we have enough trust in place to be able to have this conversation, but boy, do I sure want to try. You know, something along those lines. You have to use your own words and your own style. So let's move to um, the tougher parts, which has to do with uh, the, the, the more emotional or psychological dimensions of the trust equation, um, high intimacy and low self-orientation. One of the problems we run into is that um, we stop at CNR. 
um, which is, you know, we kind of stop at half of the equation, which I am actually going to assert to you is less than half of what's needed for trust recovery. Because when trust has been lost, there is, I, I put it in quotes, I don't mean to, it to sound quite as squishy as it does, but there's an injury that has occurred. And the injury has emotional and psychological impact. And when somebody feels like they can't trust us, we have to go to work on that as much as we have to go to work on fixing the circumstances, dealing with the consequences. So, and most of us loathe to, to go to this place for a lot of reasons, back to the question from before, all very human. Um, I, I give you, I'll just give you a quick example that I want to pull through the webinar. Because I, so be thinking about times when someone has lost trust with you. In other words, you don't trust them as much as you did before. We're doing some renovations on our house and we um, were trying to do some carefully orchestrated timing of the delivery of some materials that were needed for that. We worked with a very well-known home improvement chain in the United States, and one thing led to another, and there, were not, there was not one failure to deliver the materials we had ordered, not two failures to deliver, but three failures to deliver what, what we had ordered, all of which was supposed to come at the one time. And in the course of dealing with this organization with us, everybody was incredibly helpful, unbelievably well-meaning, super friendly, but they never dealt with the emotional or psychological side of what was happening for me, ever. It was never acknowledged, it was never spoken, it was never recognized. If they understood it, they didn't communicate that to me at all. And I'll, I will, in just a few moments, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll be more specific and explicit about what I mean by that and give you some very concrete examples. But here's the end result for me. I am probably never going to rely on this organization again for anything major that I have to do for our home and in our lives. And if you were to ask me, well, what happened? My short and simple answer would be, they failed to deliver. And yet the reality is what really happened is not they failed to deliver, but they failed to deal effectively with their failure to deliver. They did not heal the injury, if you will, at the emotional or psychological level. But just as I'm probably not going to go into some in-depth discussion about that, your clients aren't either. So your clients are going to say, forget them, they failed to deliver. But there's an opportunity in there because what was probably missed more than anything was was how you dealt with the failure to deliver. So um, the first step between I and S is to do what we call getting off your S. Self-orientation in the denominator is essentially about focus. It's about where is your attention? Is it on others or is it on you? And it's also about your motives. Why are you doing what you're doing? So now when it comes to trust recovery, very specifically, well, no, let me say in general, the biggest thing that drives our self-orientation high, which is bad by the way, because when self-orientation goes up, trustworthiness goes down, the biggest driver of high self-orientation is fear. Garden variety, human, everyday fear. And when it comes to trust recovery, see if you can relate to the kinds of fears that you might feel. You might feel fearful about dealing with their anger or being um, inappropriately or unfairly blamed for something. You might fear retribution. You might fear that if you deal with, uh, you know, you follow Andrea's advice and you deal with the emotional and psychological impact and all that yucky, squishy stuff, if you deal with the emotions of it, you're actually going to make it worse. Or you fear, ask my husband, who will tell you whenever I need to right a wrong with him, the biggest barrier I deal with is feelings of shame when I've done something. It's what stops me from being effective in, um, in healing whatever breach there was with him, as I feel a sense of shame about what's happened or what I've done. And I just, I go quiet about it. We all feel shame. It's not just me in my marriage. It's all of us as human beings can have that experience of shame. And that's just to name a few. <laughs> that's the beginning Great. of the list. We have a good question that kind of relates to that. How do we yeah. regain trust when we feel that the mix up is on, is because of something done on the other side, that it's not our, that your fault? Yeah. Um, it's a really great question. And 
So I think there are two, I'll give you short answers. One is um, you have to be willing to talk about it. So it's not trustworthy. If something has happened, they've lost trust with you and you're not telling them. You're not expressing the impact on you. You're not holding them accountable for something they should have done or didn't do. That's actually another variation. It's a variation of the intimacy variable, which we'll talk about in a minute. Holding others accountable, it builds high intimacy in a relationship. So um, having the, you know, getting past the fear of having a tough conversation and being willing to lean in and say, hey, this is awkward, this is hard, not quite sure how to bring it up. This is an issue for me and I need to understand better what happened. I wrote a weekly tip that got published today about the importance of using three words. When you're triggered by something, help me understand. We should add that, Jason, by the way, to the um, resources list that we're gonna, the resources we'll share with everybody by email at the end of the webinar. Um, so one part of the short answer is to have the conversation. The second part, and it's maybe even harder than leaning in and having the conversation, at least it is for me, is to be willing to look at what you can be responsible for. Because you know the expression, it takes two to tango in any relationship there is nearly always something for which we can all be responsible. I had a, um, a situation just a couple of months ago with a brand new client, very, very large client, big, big opportunity um, for me. And we'd been in conversation for months. We spent months working through a draft design of a series of programs that I would be delivering overseas. And, and we were at the stage where we were just sort of finalizing the contract to do the administrative stuff so we were ready to go. And that's the last time and place that you want an issue around fees to arise because you know, ideally, if you've been working the relationship well, the contract is simply um, an articulation of what you've already agreed to and you sign on the dotted line and you're done. And unfortunately, uh, the client got uh, very upset because suddenly they read the what they thought was fine print and th basically there was a misunderstanding about my rates and I really felt like um, my initial reaction was wait a minute <laughs> I have you know these six emails documenting uh, where I clearly articulated how our rate structure works and and how it would be for them and even you know added up totals and I had beautiful emails that I could print out and justify I had tables and they were shaded and you know beautifully arranged and you know multiple emails communicated after our very first meeting I was completely justified in I've done all the communicating what's going on you know why weren't you reading my messages and then I paused for a moment. I said, okay, wait a minute, practice what you preach. And I said, what can I be responsible for? And I said, uh, hold on, Andrea, you did a lot of that by email instead of in conversation. And even though they're overseas and time challenges sometimes make it hard to talk, you've had plenty of opportunities through your virtual calls, you had an in-person meeting, what was going on with you that you weren't more specific in your real-time communications with them? What was going on, Andrea, that you were saving it for email? And the honest answer was when I looked is I was avoiding it. It's my least favorite part of the work that I do is talking about fees. Um, and even though I have plenty of advice to give other people about how to do that, sometimes I just, you know, I fall down. I don't do it as well. And I stepped back and, um, I decided the right thing to do at least to lead with was to fall on my sword that I could still have my frustration that they didn't read the emails but I was going to set it aside and I could say look this is awkward this is uncomfortable I you know I'm going to take responsibility for the fact that we are where we are in this um, at this late stage of the game and here's here's what I should have done and didn't do and here's why um, and so here's the thing when you do that, when you look for what you can take responsibility for, let's be clear, it doesn't feel good. It often doesn't necessarily feel good to do what's the right thing. And it's no promise or guarantee that they're going to turn around and take responsibility for their part. And by the way, if you are going to fall on your sword, you have to not do it. 
for the with the purpose or intention that they'll turn around and say, well, I should have. But if you can just do it because the only thing we can manage is ourselves and you say, here's what I should have done differently. More often than not, because of the phenomenon of reciprocity, what you get is the same in return. And in fact, that's exactly what I got in the case of this client. I got a, an email back very quickly, completely different tone, charge released, and immediately saying, I should have been reading the messages more carefully in the first place. So I guess I said I was gonna give short bottom line answers to that, and I did neither. <laughs> so. All right, so um, this, the fear that we experience pulls us right into, let's just get on it and fix the problem. And it takes us, so it pulls us into the rational realm and takes us out of the more emotional or psychological realm. And um, now here's the thing, I, I don't know how to make your fear disappear. I have yet to figure out how to make mine go away. I do know some things that help me. One is just to acknowledge it to myself, to be aware of it, you gotta start there. The second thing that helps me is to find a way to express it, to speak it out loud, whether I'm speaking it out loud to a trusted confidant to help me just, just sort of process it a little bit or whether I'm speaking it out loud to a client um, or both, I find that helps. And then the other thing that I found that helps is simply once you've acknowledged the fear, is choose courage in the face of fear, especially when you're working at high, high levels, trusted advisor levels in an organization. It's not about being fearless. It's not about being comfortable. It's about courage, which is choosing action in the face of fear. So recognizing something for you to think about in the situation that you brought to mind, the person where you could have or should have or could or should, um, do a better job of rebuilding trust is to first ask yourself, what am I afraid of here? What could be jacking up my self-orientation? And the next thing to do is to get to work in a really earnest way on the intimacy variable of the equation. What intimacy? <laughs> it's a deliberately provocative term to use in a business setting. It basically equates to safety. Think words like safety, security, comfort, ease. And if people are gonna feel those things with us, um, whether we're building or rebuilding lost trust, then there are specific actions that we have to take. We've gotta be intentional about that. So in fact, the next five tips on the keys to rebuilding lost trust lists are all intimacy related. They're very, I'm gonna give you very concrete, specific intimacy related tips. And they all assume what I'm calling a prereq which is to get off your ass. Do the work to kind of acknowledge and manage your self-orientation before or as part of working the intimacy variable so that you really are focused on them in the process rather than on you. By the way, one of the things I meant to mention before, for those of you who entered in the poll, and I see there were quite a few of you, in fact, that drives you crazy because people can't let the baggage go. Most of the time, it's because you haven't done what's gonna show up as two through six on the list. When people can't let go of something, it's because the injury hasn't really been healed. More often than not, it's not always the case, but more often than not. So the first one on the list is prove you've heard what I just called for, um, you know, not wanting to word wrap their upset, their frustration, their struggle, their um, what it is that they're reacting to in terms of trust having been lost. Now, what do I mean by that? So I'm going to give you a very specific example here, even with some scripted language and be clear, I'm not intending for you to say these words exactly. It has to match your style and, and your approach and your way. Um, but I wanna at least give you some words and to illustrate the difference between what we typically do and what I would suggest that we should do. For those of you in the poll results who said you struggle with saying the right things, my hope is that the, this, uh, these little snippets, these little scripts will help. So imagine that the client said, like I said to that big home improvement chain or like your client might say to you, this is the third time I've raised this and the project is now at risk of delay. 
to whether rightly or wrongly you did or didn't screw up in their mind you screwed something up or there's something going on for them most of us we want to get to work to fix it and our first response is here's how we can fix it slightly better response in terms of proving you've heard they're upset i hear you even better yet you know what if i were you i'd be frustrated now this may seem like semantics or you know slightly different words or what's the really big difference here i would suggest to you that there actually is a really big difference and in fact um, if you're inclined, for those of you who see it, if you begin to type into uh, text chat what you see in terms of the difference, um, I'll tell you what I see in terms of the difference. You're acknowledging an emotion. You're not just speaking in generalities. Yes, and I see words coming through. Empathy, empathy, empathy. Yes, 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 yes. And it's a very specific form of empathy, not just a generalized, I hear you. Now. Um, this may seem obvious, it's not so easy when they're upset or when you might be feeling, let's say, a little shame. This is actually hard to do. Most of us don't do enough of the, I'd be frustrated if I were you. There's a great story, it happened for any of you who happen to have a copy of the Trusted Advisor Field Book on page 45 of the book. There is a story, we're also gonna send a link to the excerpted story, which is available online. Our associate Kate Gregory tells about having to deal with uh, a lot of turnover. She was a manager on a project, four people turned over with this client in less than three months. So you can imagine what it's like to have to have that conversation over and over and over again, because we're ha her hands were tied at the time to do anything about it. The only tool that she had to draw on was the tool of listening and allowing her client to vent. And interestingly, it was the venting that made the difference in the case. And oh, by the way, after the fourth person turned over, when she actually offered to say, this clearly isn't working, let me find another firm to help you. The client said, no, I wanna work with you on this. This is unfortunate, this isn't working, and I'm committed to working with you. Speaking of venting as well, there's another resource we will be sharing. It's from a friend of a friend. Mark Bolston is not an associate of ours, but he's a friend of a friend who's a business psychiatrist. As part of his medical training, he learned about, uh, okay, I hope you all have had lunch already, but draining abscesses. <laughs> and he likens the importance when someone is venting, when somebody has emotional charge around something, the importance of listening as a way of draining the abscess. In fact, you have to listen, you've got to drain before you administer an antibiotic, before you administer a fix to the problem. Next on the list, third, something else that many of us are loath to do, explore and acknowledge the impact. We definitely typically don't do this enough. Um, we fear, for example, that we're gonna upset them more if we do it. Um, but there is a paradox at play here, which is when we lean in, they're actually more inclined to let go. So take the situ same situation, move past the typical, here's how we can fix it, slightly better, hmm, that's not good. And even better yet is to actually show that you're paying attention to what they're saying, which the big home improvement chain did not do with me. Oh, okay, you said you've raised this three times. It means it's taking time for you from other things. And you said delays. I would imagine those are potentially costly. A very different reaction from the other two options. The next one actually is a quite provocative one because I'm suggesting that you apologize uh, or at the very least take responsibility. And when we feel wronged or when we're afraid of protecting ourselves or we're consulting our legal departments about how should we handle this trust recovery, uh, most of the time the last thing that we want to do is apologize. We fear it. Uh, and there is something very powerful in doing that. By the way, um, studies show that surgeons who actually acknowledge when they've made a mistake in surgery, when they acknowledge and apologize to the patient, guess what? They don't get sued. So just some language to put some concreteness around it instead of here's how we can fix it or even I or we owe you an apology, make it more personal. I, I could have done better. Specifically, I should have blah, blah, blah. And I'm personally taking responsibility for this. And by the way, I suggest you do it 
even if it was your team member who screwed up and you're ending up as the fall guy, um, or maybe the client, as in the story that I shared um, before, maybe the client has a role to play. And I'm not telling you you should let the client off the hook. There is a time and a place to say if they don't offer it up, hey, <laughs> there's another side to this that I think we need to look at to make sure um, that we've really addressed this. But I'm a big fan of starting with what you can own and what you can personally take responsibility for. Tip number five on the list, I've simply called it offering to make them whole. And I think that often gets forgotten or skipped. Well, what do I mean by this? I'll give you an example. Um, uh, Charlie and I have a pretty big admin team to support the businesses that we run and they are amazing. And every once in a while, because they're human beings, they screw something up. For example, you know, uh, a wrong order on a participant guide um, print order. And it, you know, it costs four or $500 that we can't recover from the client. It's, it's not the end of the world, but it's not a small bit of change either. Although, you know, if you're an admin on a team, that represents a pretty big piece of your salary that's not trivial for you and it means so much to us when an offer is made to make us whole for it. I'll speak for myself it means something to me you know yikes $500 error completely screwed that up um, you know let me take it off my my next so let's take it off my next invoice or um, let me make it up to with time and the funny thing about making the offer to make people whole is that very often it's the offer that counts more than anything. Um, because I know when the offer is made to me, very often I decline it. And I'll say, don't worry about it, it's okay, we all learned. Or, you know what, why don't you give me two hours free in the next month? Uh, it tends to invoke an attitude of generosity in other people. And if, it ha if you haven't done something that costs somebody else money, I haven't cost that one client, the overseas client, any money, um, but I did work hard to say, okay, how can we, you know, what are some creative ways that we can adapt to this or deal with this? How can I adjust in order to make it better, um, to, to deal with the, the fact that the rate confusion means you're gonna be paying more than you thought you were going to be paying. So some language to consider here, it's not perfect language on this slide, but better than, you know, I wish this hadn't happened is, you know, I, I'd at least try, I'd like to try to lessen the impact by, or my offer to you is, or here's what I can do in the situation. All right, we're almost done. I got an eye on time. Last and not least, uh, commit to preventing it. By the way, I, I strongly encourage, use this as a checklist and reflect back on the situation that you had brought to mind before. Be an honest, be a hard grader and an honest grader for yourself. How well did you do each of these six things? Um, where was there an opportunity to step in and do something better? What could you go back and repair with them now? Or what might you simply do, do better next time? To me, prevention is key. It's, you know, it's one thing to say, we've got this handled, it won't happen again. But to me, it's a big intimacy builder if you actually say to somebody, look, we've escalated this. It's on the agenda next week to make sure it doesn't happen again. I feel important if you're gonna tell that to me. And I also feel much more confident that if I continue to work with you, it's not gonna happen again. So I've mapped this to intimacy, but I would actually say you get a trust trifecta out of this one. Uh, credibility, reliability, and intimacy on this. So now you could, for some of you, this, this might actually cause you to break out in a mild or severe case of hives. <laughs> you could say all of these things together. In fact, I could in, imagine a dialogue where you might, potentially even in this order, with pauses in between, by the way, there's white space for a reason, but you could work through all of these intimacy builders in your attempt to do your trust recovery. And you'll notice that le very last on the list is the now, here's how we can fix it. So, uh, I'm, and by the way, if the thought of doing all of this is just profoundly uncomfortable or just doesn't seem realistic or um, uh, doesn't sit well with you, 
pick one or do half or choose the one that you're the most uncomfortable with and practice and play and experiment and see what happens. So I'm curious, the person you brought to mind, if anybody's having any insights about that, I'd love to hear about that over text chat or take uh, last questions that you have. So we have one question that just came up and everybody else that's on, feel free to uh, type any questions into the chat box or, or we can actually do a live live read if you if you feel like getting on the uh, on the audio but the first question is what are other tangible ways to reduce the s uh, self-orientation or in rebuilding trust good question by the way because i realized we're at time i just want to pop up the resources slide um and then i'll come back and in fact i'm i'm free i'm gonna i can stay on until the top of the hour to continue with the q a but you will be getting a list of resources uh, some that refresh on the topics covered today, uh, some, some new pieces. Um, uh, we've got some, uh, sorry, I just had the poll thing pop up in. Right, I just launched the, the other poll. Of, of, oh yeah, uh, got it. in terms of the value that you got. So if you do have to exit, please let us know how valuable this was for you. Uh, we've got weekly tips, a trust quotient self-assessment if you're more interested, if you're interested in knowing how you score on the trust equation and you haven't done that yet with us, seven free videos, you can check out a whole bunch of stuff. So concrete ways to reduce the S, other tangible ways. You know, that's, I think it's a great question and it's a tough one because I think S is in many ways the hardest of all of them because it takes so much self-awareness. But I'll give you a few of my favorite tips. One is to be as self-aware as possible, which means, you know, not in a narcissistic navel-gazing kind of way, but in a get to know yourself kind of way, do everything that you can to know your strengths, your weaknesses, your hot buttons. Take every self-assessment or you know, multi-rater instrument you can. Understand your personality. Uh, take leadership classes and programs. Just, just get to know yourself because um, the blind spots are what get us in trouble. And at least if the blind spots are revealed, none of us is gonna become a perfect human being, and that's not the goal anyway. But when we see the trouble spots for ourselves, then we, at least we can step in and manage them. And my second, just sort of generalized tip for keeping self-orientation low is to do, and as I say this, I'm reminding myself, I need to do a better job of practicing what I preach right now, is to do whatever you can in your life, have a practice or ritual or routine or multiples that keep you grounded and that help you keep your perspective on things, whether it's an exercise regimen or regularly walking with a dog or playing with your kids or grandkids or time in the art studio, that's a big one for me. Um, gratitude journaling, daily journaling, transcendental meditation, walks in the woods, I don't care, woo-woo or not woo-woo, whatever <laughs> it is that keeps you calm and grounded and less reactive in life, I think is a, a generally great uh, tip, whether you're rebuilding trust or trying to build it in the first place. So we have a, so what, we have a request to go back to the previous slide with all five tips so somebody can just see that. But we're going to be sending the video out to everybody on the email as well, so you'll, you'll have a recording of that. Um, so there's a request just to go back one slide. Um, one question that I think is a, is a really great question is, can this formula be used regardless of your work experience level compared to your client's level of experience? Does it matter how far along you are in your career? Uh, I think the short answer is absolutely not. It doesn't matter one bit. So let me make sure I understand the question. So the yeah, the question is, your, in other words, if your client is 30 years in and you're a year into your job, by all means, you will distinguish yourself by understanding and applying the trust equation. I mean, there are people who are 40 years in who still don't get it. So, um, and I also think that, you know, when you're, when you're relatively young and you have less experience, the honesty dimension of credibility is such an important element of it, being willing to you know, admit what you don't know, not try to pretend that you know more than you do, not try to pretend be someone you're not, just be really okay with exactly who you are and, and you know, self-assured and some knowledge that you're going to bring some value, if nothing else you bring commitment to bringing value. So that's all the questions on the board. Does anybody else have anything they want to contribute? I don't, I don't know if Charlie wants to 
add anything either, but as an option. Charlie's got, I see in the text chat, it's a great one, another S solution to the question of how do you, how do you get off and stay off your S is not ABC always be closing, but always be curious. And curiosity is a great antidote to high self-orientation. It's another reason that those words help me understand. It's almost like they force you into a place of curiosity. Yeah, it's a great ABC. Great. Well, if there's no more questions, I think we can, we can just wrap it up. I want to thank everybody for attending. As everyone's going to get an email with all the resources that were mentioned. Um, if you have any questions, you can reach directly um, out to Andrea or, or Charles Green. Um, they're, they're always happy to get back and have conversations about all this material. And there'll be a, a recording of the webinar uh, in full form in the, in the link if you want to share it with anybody or, or review. Um, so thanks, thanks a lot, everybody. And, and we're going to keep these up. There's going to be three more webinars throughout the year. If you go to uh, trustedadvisor.com or the Get Real Project, you can, you can see the upcoming webinars. We'll put those in the follow-up email as well. Thanks a lot. And thanks to you, Jason, and thanks, everybody.